Welcome to Evidence Based, a new Harbinger psychology podcast. We're your hosts, Cassie and Kendall. On today's episode, we're talking about resilience. Our guest is Dr. Sheila Raja. Dr. Raja is an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She completed postdoctoral training at the National Center for PTSD and is a nationally recognized expert on the health effects of trauma and trauma informed healthcare approaches. Her other books include Overcoming Trauma and PTSD, The PTSD Survival Guide for Teens, and The Sexual Trauma Workbook for Teen Girls. Hi, Sheila. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're excited to be talking with you about resilience. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Sheila, and to start with an establishing question, which we usually do, um, I wondered if you could talk about what resilience is and what it means to be resilient. Yes, um, that is such a, a good question because it's a word that we hear so much in common conversation and I think in the media, and it helps to know, you know, where does this word come from, right? Um, if we look at just the textbook definition, it means, you know, can something go back to its original shape? Like we could say, hey, nylon is a really resilient material. And physiologically, we know that the brain is able to reorganize and regenerate sometimes. Um, we talk about neuroplasticity, that's like a fancy word, but what does it mean psychologically, right? It's the ability to really bounce back from setbacks. It's our ability to adapt and change um, when we experience stress. Um, but that's not an innate, it's not something we're just born with, right? It can be learned. And so that's what I think is important for us to remember is that it's what do we do when we have setbacks, when we have failure, when we have stressors in our life, you know, how do we, how do we rise to that occasion? Like you said, we hear the word resilience a lot. And another word that comes up a lot is grit. Can you talk about the difference between resilience and grit and maybe some common misconceptions about what resilience is and what it isn't? Yeah. So grit is really this idea of getting up every day and working towards a goal. Um, It's that idea of tenacity. So you could think about the entrepreneur who's not going to give up, right? Um, That's the idea of grit. Resilience is more about what happens when we have failures, when we have setbacks or even trauma. Um, How can we function in the presence of stress, either short term or ongoing? Um, You know, what can we do? And so, um, you know, one of the critiques and and we'll kind of I think I'm sure we'll talk more about this. But one of the critiques about grit is that it overlooks how institutional structures, things like racism, sexism, homophobia, how does that get in our way of being resilient and our ability to persevere? But you know, we'll talk about how we can kind of include those things in our definition as well. And in terms of your question about misconceptions, um, you know, I think the biggest misconception, which is why uh, I really welcome the chance to talk about this is um, that resilience is innate, that it's something we're born with. Like, oh, he's just a resilient guy. She's just a resilient person. They're just resilient. Um, I I think that's one misconception, that it's not something, that it's not a set of practices, because it really is. And then the other is that the more we experience trauma, the more resilient we are. And I think that that's based on this idea that somehow people desensitize to trauma or stress, which unfortunately we know um, psychologically just isn't the case, right? Um, Maybe psychologically we find ways to stop thinking about our our stressors or traumas in a conscious way, but we also know that stress and trauma manifest in our health, our blood pressure, our physiology. So I guess to me, the biggest misconceptions are one, you know, you're kind of born with this or you're not, and two, you know, the more practiced we are, the better it is for us. I don't think that's true either. You know, stress accumulates on our body. So we have to find ways to practice resilience in our everyday life. I really appreciate knowing the exact difference between the two, because you do hear grit and resilience thrown around often. And moreover, you hear people describing someone, like you said, as resilient, you know, they're just resilient kind of as a catch-all, but you're right. There's usually so much more 
to what that means and why that person is resilient, what's kind of happened in their life to to lead them there. And as we're talking about resilience and kind of unpacking what that means, can you talk about the different types of resilience? Are there different types and what should we know about them? Right. And it's like, you know, the more you read about resilience, the more we study resilient people. Um, Of course, there's all different stuff out there about you know, there's this kind of resilience, there's that kind of resilience in my book, what I what I try to do is, you know, really look at what makes people resilient, um, both clinically and also in the literature and try to find ways to make it all relatable. And so I think that the different kinds of resilience that people seem to resonate with in terms of how do we put this in practice, right in our lives, if we're looking at this as a set of skills, what could they be? And I think sort of the the first set of skills has to do with how do you take care of your body, right? Um, Exercise, diet, good sleep, you know, taking care of ourselves physiologically. Um, And then there's our mind, which is of course related, right? Our mental health. What are are the things that we're doing, um, you know, to make sure we're okay, that we're not overwhelmed with depression, anxiety, things like that. So sort of our, our body and our mind. And then there's also relationship resilience, right? Are we forming connections in the world that are healthy, that are meaningful? Um, and then finally, our connection to sort of a deeper purpose in our life. How do we find meaning and purpose in our world? So I think of resilience as sort of four quadrants, um, taking care of your mind, taking care of your body, taking care of your relationships, and then finding your meaning and purpose. And I feel like... Um, Many times folks say, oh, I find that kind of relatable because I feel like I can look at my life and say, okay, well, where am I at on on those four quadrants? I want to ask a little bit of a follow-up question to that, the four quadrants. In your work, are you finding it harder, you know, during the pandemic, during everything that feels like trauma is compounding on top of trauma, the shared trauma, really? Um What's coming up for you in your practice that you're finding um, about resilience and sort of the current landscape? Oh, absolutely. I mean, people are exhausted. Uh, We talk about the idea of, you know, we use the word decision fatigue. Um, You know, when it used to be a very small decision, do I go to the grocery store today? Right. And now it's, well, what's the COVID rates in my area? And are people masking? Are they not masking? Do I have a relative that's at high risk? Or maybe I'm a high risk myself? Or, you know, what's going to happen with my kid's school? Or are they behind on their schoolwork? And what's the violence rates in my community? And do I feel safe? And so everything is compounding. And so I think it becomes even harder to practice resilience. People are very, very tired. And the first thing to go often is taking care of our bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Our diet, our exercise. I mean, you know, I'm going to be honest. Mine's not where it was three years ago when I composed (laughs) the book. Um, You know, can't do this work if we're not honest. We're all human beings. And it's been a very difficult couple of years. Um, You know, the American Psychological Association does a lot of stress in America surveys, and they're finding that people are stressed. Um, People from minority communities are very stressed. Parents, very stressed about lots of different things happening in our country, which is why I think we have to have these conversations about resilience. And and I'm sure we'll get to this, but resilience is not only an individual level thing, but there's things that, you know, our workplaces and our institutions need to do to support us as well. Definitely. Definitely. And um, in your book, you talk a lot about post-traumatic growth. Can you talk about what that is and how it comes into play with resilience? Yeah, I mean, they're really related, but there's this idea of resilience is really our ability to function, right? So can we get up after stress or ongoing stressors in our life? And can we do what we need to do, you know? Can we get up and make breakfast in the morning for our kids? Can we, if we're, if you're a teenager, can you get up and go to school? You know, can you participate in class? Are, do you have a few friends? Um, that our resilience is really about our ability to function. Post-traumatic growth is really this idea that if you've been through something that you consider traumatic in your life, whether that's, you know, abuse or violence or something like that, um, 
how can you find a way to make meaning and purpose? So, you know, when I talked about those quadrants that are associated with resilience, you know, first we need to take care of our, our bodies and our minds, right? And make sure that we're okay emotionally and physically. Then you can start building social support and finding meaning and purpose. And so I would say post-traumatic growth is most closely related to that idea of how do we find meaning and purpose based on what we've experienced in our lives. And that doesn't mean, by the way, like, oh, I'm so glad I went through that trauma. You know, no one ever says that, nor should they. Um, it's more about given what I've gone through, how can I make sense of it? So as we're talking about resilience, and it feels like to people when they think about building resilience, it can feel like this massive undertaking, or they're not really sure even what that looks like. When we're taking care of ourselves through resilience, why is a routine so important? And what are some examples of how you could establish a routine to kind of help build that resilience and make it more uh, accessible? Yeah, you know, when we look at resilient people and when we look at, um, you know, when we look at also what the studies say in this area, it all points in the same direction. Um, and in general, I would say kind of points to that old 80-20 rule. I think we've all heard that. Um, you know, if 80% of the time our routine is kind of predictable, then 20% of the time it can be a little less predictable. And I know people hear that and think, wow, that sounds so boring. Um, you know, what am I? Uh, but, but I think that one of the ways we could think about this is if we want to keep it simple, five days a week, if we can have a relatively, um, if we can have a routine in our lives, and then two days a week, which is usually like the weekend for many people, um, you know, it can be a little less structured. So, for example, if I'm able to get in some moderate level of exercise and my diet is not so bad on five days of the week, then I can plan a little less on the weekend. Um, similarly with my sleep, you know, if mostly I have a routine, then if I'm up late on one day, my body can kind of absorb that stress. And I think the best way to think about that is it's like driving with a full tank of gas most of the time. So that way, you know, if you have an unexpected detour in your life, you don't have to stress about finding that gas station, right? So it's, it's kind of like why we all feel so worn out, I think, after, you know, this pandemic and everything we've been through the last several years, there's been stress upon stress, and we feel like we're not already running on a full tank. And then something happens and we're like, where's the gas station? We're in trouble. So this is where I think pulling back and saying, okay, what are we trying to do? Starting with our physiology is really important. Along with the physiology, I think comes a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, maybe some more, more subtle than, you know, the like eating bad or not sleeping. Can you talk about how um, a person might recognize when a coping mechanism isn't helping them? Um, and how can they start to make a change from that? Because maybe it's become so normalized to them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, right. There's the obvious ones, right? There's the, I'm eating a lot more cake than I used to eat, or, you know, a lot, it's too many desserts, or I'm not exercising at all. Um, you know, the glasses of wine are getting bigger for some people, <laughs> right? Like what is, what is one serving? Um, you know, sometimes with that, we call it in psychology, self-monitoring, the idea of writing down, you know, what are you, what are you um, doing and facing some of those things is important. Um, you know, when we look at weight loss long-term, it's really fascinating that one of the biggest predictors of being able to keep weight off long-term is simply writing down what you're eating. And it doesn't even mean that you have to be actively trying to change it. It's just sometimes when we look at it on paper, we're like, Ooh, didn't see that. I mean, you know, you kind of, you can't run away from it when it's on paper. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are harder to self monitor these days. And that's the avoidance that we're all doing, right? The idea that maybe I'm scrolling social media all the time as a way to kind of in my mind, like escape from things, but then now I'm on social media for hours and I don't feel better. Um, this is where I think maybe we don't we don't write down ourselves how long we're on social media, but some of those apps that track your time can be useful. And maybe you can like track your mood before and after and say, huh, 
you know, on days when I'm on there for three hours in a row, I don't feel so great. Um, but I also think we just have to be honest with ourselves, right? It's been a hard few years. Um, and it's okay right now if you're not at your goal weight. It's okay if, you know, and that doesn't mean we don't want to make changes, but I think we don't want to beat ourselves up also as that we're bad people, um, because that's going to keep us stuck from being able to make any changes. You know, part of unhealthy coping is also just burying our heads in the sand. So I think part of it is being gentle with ourselves, but also starting to face some of those habits. And it's hard. It's it's definitely not an easy task, you know? Definitely. And I have found that when I'm faced, like you're talking, hey, you can't run from paper. It is really hard to see how long you've spent on your phone or how much you've consumed um, wine, things like that, and how it's gone up during those times. Um, and kind of in line with talking about unhealthy coping mechanisms, in your teen book, you talk about harm reduction. Could you talk a little bit about that and what that looks like? Yes, absolutely. Um, so harm reduction is this idea that while abstinence might be our ultimate goal, right? Like we don't want to use tobacco. We don't want to use um you know, alcohol, we don't want to vape, we don't want to, you know, we don't want our, our kids um, using, using uh, cannabis, for example, um, unless it's medically supervised. But here's the thing, abstinence might be the goal, but in the meantime, what can you do in your own life to cut down on something that you feel is harmful to your body and your relationships? So it's not the same, harm reduction isn't the same as condoning substance use, um, which is what a, I think a, a myth out there, but it's a less stigmatizing way to approach it. So, you know, when we dig deep into resilient teens or even resilient, well, yeah, especially resilient teens, I'm going to say it's pretty clear. The younger you are, the fewer substances you want in your body on a regular basis. And I'm, I am talking about things like vaping and cannabis and alcohol because brain development, you know, we're still really at the surface of understanding how the adolescent brain develops, but we know that it's a very, very critical period of development, right? Um, both emotionally, physically, um, learning new things. And, you know, it's precious, quite frankly. And that said, though, we have to be realistic, right? I have two teens myself, teens experiment, teens, there are, there's peer pressure. Um, and it's important, I think, for young people to be honest with themselves. Um, you know, is this all your peer group is doing is maybe using substances? Then maybe you need to think about making some changes to your friend circle. Um, is this how you're coping when you're feeling down? You know, um, then you might need to find an adult to help you brainstorm on some other things. And again, not in a we need to. I think what I like about harm reduction is that it's not judgmental, right? It's not about you're a bad person. It's, you know, this is what's happening. How can we help you to be healthier? Um, and I've been very surprised at how insightful teens can be when they have that non-judgmental space. I mean, it's kind of the non-judgmental space all of us would want, right? Even as adults. As we're talking about harm reduction, I wondered, so a lot of it was focused on like substances, vaping, things like that. Could you apply those same types of um, strategies to different things that could be equally as harmful, maybe like to the mind or something like that, that they could be engaging with? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, uh -huh. you know, we have to be realistic about things like, for example, social media, right? I mean, Yes, I have a, I have these, these few rare friends that are, they seem to be very at peace and they're like, I don't engage in social media at all. I'm just, I'm, I'm disconnected when I go home. That's it. That's great. <laughs> Most of us can't operate on that abstinence only model, right? Of engagement in technology, for example. Um, so we have to figure out, okay, well, I'm going to use this, but how am I using it? How does it make me feel after I use it? Um, is there a way that I can do it for a limited amount of time? Um, you know, I, I think that, yeah, we can absolutely use that for lots of different habits because life isn't all or nothing, right? I think an underlying thought to all of this part of the conversation is shame. So I want to ask a little bit about that and 
One, why does it play such a large role in trauma? And what is the purpose of shame? Yeah. And, you know, this is something that in, in all of my books around PTSD and trauma and resilience, we talk about the difference between shame or guilt. Um, sometimes, you know, fancy word for that can be behavioral self-blame, but nonetheless, shame is the idea of I'm a bad person. Okay. So sh shame is a really primal emotion. It's, it's really deeply rooted in helping us engage in cooperative behavior, right? Human beings are social animals. And so um, I feel shame if I steal from somebody, if I hurt somebody, right? It's deep rooted to kind of make us cooperate with one another as a species, ideally. Um, and that's kind of the purpose of shame. But the problem is if all we feel is shame, and sometimes when you're multiply traumatized, you start to think you're a bad person um, and that you deserved it, which is of course not true, not the case, but you may not believe that. And if all you do is feel shame, it keeps you stuck. So guilt is this idea about, I did something bad. So for example, this isn't about trauma, but let's say that a young person stole something, right? They could say, well, I stole something. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad kid. I'm just, yeah, you know what? I, I'm horrible. No wonder my parents don't like me. And when we feel like that about ourselves, what's the incentive to change, right? Because you feel like you can't. That's just who you are. Versus guilt is I did something bad and I can learn from it. Okay, well, I, you know, I took that. I took that $10. That wasn't mine. And I feel bad now and I don't need to do that again. I can figure out how to make that that right. I can figure out how to do better in the future. So guilt gives us the opportunity to change and shame keeps us stuck. Shame's about who we are. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It felt like it, we were hearing the difference between grit and resilience again. Like I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I get it. The difference between <laughs> shame and guilt, which you also kind of group together and and use synonymously, but it does seem like there is a divide there for when they come into play. Yes. And I do feel like clinically, you know, it's, you hear it, you hear it so often you hear it in young people, but you hear it in parents too. Well, yeah, I'm just not a good parent. Yeah. I guess I just don't have what it takes. I mean, once it's, it comes about you as the person, how can we learn from that? How can we change? And so that's, again, I think something we really need to get a conversation going about, um, is the difference between shame and guilt. Well, it's, it's the difference between taking the easy way out of just writing yourself off as this is just how I behave because I am bad versus making that change. Yeah. And it's, and it's liberating a lot of times. I mean, there, and sometimes there, are, there are little things we can control and that doesn't make us just because something bad happens to us. That doesn't make us a bad person just because maybe we do something that we don't like later on, we look back and say, I mm, shouldn't have done that. That doesn't make us a bad person, but it definitely gives us a lot more, you know, the word we use in psychology, right? Self-efficacy, the feeling of yeah. like, okay, I can do something to change. And, and that, that helps to take a little bit of power back in our own lives. Earning your continuing education hours doesn't have to be a painful experience. The right course can open your mind to new possibilities, increase your confidence, and hand you powerful tools to transform your clients' lives. Praxis Continuing Education and Training teams up with some of the brightest minds in mental health to provide cutting-edge, evidence-based training for practitioners. You can learn firsthand from experts like Stephen C. Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Robin Walzer, Kirk Strausel, and many others. Find your next training at PraxisCET.com. That's PraxisCET.com. So in line with that, as we're talking about managing feelings and emotions, can you talk a little bit about emotional tolerance and what that is? Yeah. Um, so emotional tolerance is such an interesting word, right? Tolerance doesn't mean like, yeah, sign me up. I love feeling depressed. I just enjoy anxiety. Never met that person. I, you know, <laughs> that that's just not realistic. Right. But we have to remember that I think a lot of our culture is built around trying to escape negative emotions. 
you know, like whether that's shopping or eating or, you know, drinking too much wine or, um, you know, scrolling through, so, you know, doom scrolling as they call it. Um, so this doesn't mean that we're telling you to wallow in your negative emotions, but emotional tolerance is a, res a resilient skill because learning how to tolerate some negative emotions is a part of life, right? Everyone is going to experience that. And we need to learn sometimes that we can sit with those negative feelings and that they will pass and that we have the skills um, to be able to deal with them, you know, um, to kind of let those wash over us. Because, you know, the example that I use in the resilience book, and I probably some of the other books as well that I've written is, you know, there's that classic psych psychology study where they tell people, you know, don't think about a white bear. Um, you can do anything but think about a white bear. And lo and behold, what do people think about a white bear? <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to be anxious. Well, then what do you feel? Anxious, right? Whereas if you say, I think I'm just going to feel like this for a little bit. Sometimes when we stop fighting the emotion, then those secondary emotions of feeling guilty or bad about it or feeling like we shouldn't feel like that, that sort of goes away and it gives it gives the emotion sort of a chance to recede a little bit more. Um, it's probably one of the most difficult resilient skills. It takes a lot of practice, I would say. And it's something, I mean, I've practiced, I, I, you know, I'm certainly not the master at it at all. You know, it's something you have to commit to, to trying all the time. And some days are harder than others. And that's okay. That's, an, that's a part of being alive, I think. Yeah. And a big part of that, it sounds like, is just the noticing when you feel that way. Um, so I wondered if we could talk a little bit about how mindfulness helps with resilience. Yeah. You know, again, we all have failures and stress. And often when those things happen and, and that if the stressor isn't, you know, something that's immediate right in front of us, right? But we're replaying it in our minds and we're like, oh no, this happened, this happened, this happened, or oh no, this will happen. This is going to happen in the future, right? Mindfulness is just a way of coming back to the moment. Um, it doesn't have to be meditation. It can be something as simple as washing the dishes and feeling, you know, the water in your hands. It can be as simple as, eating an orange and, you know, noticing the color and the smell, um, you know, really early in the pandemic, very early in the pandemic, you know, when uh, people were washing all their groceries down, I was one of those people, I'll admit it. And, um, you know, we didn't know how COVID was transmitted. And so everyone was washing their groceries. And I turned it into a little, I, I was also in the process of writing the mindfulness book, or I'm sorry, writing the resilience book at the time. <laughs> and um, I was like, maybe I could try to turn this whole washing my groceries thing into a mindfulness exercise. And I would sit there and I would feel the water, you know, as I wash the produce or I wipe down the box of pasta. And then I take a minute to think about the chain that got the food there, you know, the farmer that still had to go out and, you know, pick this, the, the truck driver that was still working to drive this across the country, the person, the stock person that put it on the shelves, the checker that was still at work, um, and try to develop a sense of gratitude as well for, you know, everything that got that box of pasta to my house. So, you know, on some days, on some days, I would say it, it worked fairly well, but it was certainly an interesting exercise. I think what's so interesting with mindfulness, when you talk about it with people who are not super familiar with what it looks like in practice, they, um, yeah, they, they go instantly go to meditation or they're thinking it's this really complex, um, exercise. And when I've experienced mindfulness in my own life, it's similar to that, like doing a simple task and really being in the moment of doing it and kind of putting my thoughts into that one thing that I'm doing. Um, and so by knowing that it's much more accessible for people to kind of like enter into that space to know that it, it isn't this big, uh, you know, meditative practice right off the bat, it can look like a lot of different things. Um, and as we've been talking about resilience, uh, building resilience within ourselves and emotional tolerance and mindfulness and things like that, I want to talk about taking it outward. And so you talk about creating safe connections as a part of building resilience. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it's important to the process? Yeah. I mean, I think that it really resilience, you cannot 
be a resilient person and have no connections. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's pretty rare. When we look at who is resilient, almost nobody can heal alone. And I think that in our culture too, again, when we we're talking about myths, right, around some of this stuff, we have this idea that resilient people are these sort of, they grin and bear it and they, you know, they never show emotions, but stoicism isn't the same as strength. Um, people really can't bounce back from stress alone. And I've often, you know, when I um, give different talks on trauma and PTSD, I, I will often say, you know, if, if um, you know, if we didn't need human connection, if we, if stoicism and, and sort of uh, rugged individualism was what helped us heal, the United States would have been like, we would have been into social isolation, like in a big way, right? We, we would have been fine in, uh, you know, those days of uh, the stay at home orders at the beginning of COVID. But as we know, on week two, people were like, I want to go back to church and I miss my work and I miss my friends and I miss going out. That's normal, right? Um, we need to have safe connections in our life. And I think for me, and I think for a lot of clients, what helps is to think about the types of support that you have in life. So it's not just, oh, we need social support. I mean, social support takes all different forms. One, there's sort of this traditional, what we think of emotional support, right? The person that's going to listen to you when you're down, the person that give, you know, we, Ideally, we need we need someone like like that in our life that's going to listen to us. We also need instrumental support. We need people that can do stuff, right? Uh, you know, I'm sick. Do you mind swinging by the grocery store and just putting some milk on my doorstep, right? Or I was sick. Can you bring my can you bring my homework? You know, if you're a teen, to somebody, someone that can maybe they're not the best listener, and that's okay. But will they help you out? And will you help them out? Um, Sometimes people aren't the best listeners and they don't necessarily do stuff, but they're just fun. I think we tend to underrate that too. We need a few of those people as well. Like not everyone can do everything. And then another kind of support that I think is really useful to think about is what we call informational or educational support. So when we have a specific problem, like, and we need someone who's kind of an expert, can they give us information we can trust, right? Information about college applications, information about um, how COVID is spread, you know, information about, you know, what is good therapy, right? So I think that we, when we think about different types of support, there's emotional, instrumental, sort of our take a break or fun circle of people. And then, you know, who are people that we trust as, as experts in certain areas. And so when we think about those safe connections, we really have to almost do an audit of our social support network every now and then and say, well, where are we at? Um, you know, do we need to increase any of the people in those areas? I really like that because I'm a big social person, like talking, to, talking out my feelings and what's going on. And my anxiety is a form of self-care for me. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about self-care and how, like, I feel like the traditional talks about self-care leave out the mental health aspect. Can you talk about why it's important to bring that into self-care and make that its own form of self-care? Yeah. I mean, we really need to destigmatize taking care of our mental health. Um, we really need to get real about talking about anxiety, about talking about depression. This is more than just taking a bubble bath. It's more than just lighting a scented candle, right? Um, Many people, many of us have struggled with periods of depression, periods of anxiety, and we need more help. Um, maybe we need to talk to a counselor. Maybe we need other types of social support in our lives. And so um, I think that it's really important for us to, one, destigmatize that. Um, mental health, suffer suffering from de depression is no different than suffering from diabetes. And we need to look at it in the same way. Um, and then I think we also, I'm really happy to see that in some states, for example, young people are now allowed to take mental health days off, whether that's because they have to go to therapy or just because they need a day off. Um, and I think that that's one good way that institutions are kind of recognizing that this is an issue too. So, you know, 
it goes beyond just sort of the traditional self-help self-care strategies. I think you're right. I've appreciated seeing more of a conversation around this in more recent times, especially working for New Harbinger. You know, we're so desperate to see like some real um, efficacious strategies out there to help people with their mental health versus like you're saying, kind of those like take a walk or take a bath. Like it's been nice to see people entering in the conversation more freely, um, we could say as a, as a collective. Um, and I wanted to talk about something that you mentioned in the beginning of this conversation, that when we're talking about resilience, a lot of resilience comes from a past trauma, like there's a connection there. So I wondered, how can we build resilience from that past trauma or kind of use that experience to help in that process? Yeah, I think that my biggest thought on this issue is that when you've had a past trauma or multiple past traumas, it's important to start slow. Often, um, I see very well-meaning, especially young people, they jump into trying to find meaning and purpose in a really good way, mind you, because we need them. We need them to change the world and to educate and their voice, we need their voice. Um, but they try to find meaning and purpose based on what they've been through before they focus on their own emotional health, physical health, and connections. So I think that when we build resilience and we think of those four quadrants, I, I do caution folks who've been through multiple traumas in their life or even one trauma to think about how am I doing first, my physical health, my emotional health, you know, my social support. And once you feel a little bit steady with that, it doesn't mean you have to feel great every day. It doesn't have to be perfect, but that you feel like, okay, you know, I've got something in place here, uh, you know, on those three quadrants where I'm able to kind of get up and function, then you can kind of look into building meaning and purpose. Because I think if you jump into that too soon, it can be overwhelming. Sheila, I wondered if you could talk about um, active coping. That's something you talk about in your book. Can you talk about what that looks like in practice? Yeah, you know, avoidance is sort of we when we've been through trauma, when we go through stress, our first reaction, you know, physically, emotionally is avoidance, right? Like, I don't want to go through that again. That person stresses me out. I don't want to be around them anymore. Or, you know, that makes me anxious. So I'm just not going to go to that place anymore, right? Avoidance works really, really well in the short term. In the long term, of course, we know that it makes our life really small, right? Um, because maybe we're avoiding certain social situations or we're avoiding certain types of people or going to certain places, whether we've been through something traumatic or whether we've been through something stressful, we want to avoid it. Um, so active coping isn't the same as what we call flooding, right? Flooding is like, okay, I'm going to jump into the deep end of the pool and, you know, just do what, do what I'm afraid of. That's kind of like those, um, you know, the self-help posters that say like, you know, it's got the guy jumping, you know, off the huge high, high diving board and says, do what you fear the most and that sort of stuff, um, which is great as a poster, but not necessarily great as a, a psychological technique, right? Active coping is much less dramatic. It's more about how do we break things down into smaller steps and work on what challenges us, but in small and meaningful ways. So for example, you know, if you're a young person and you're afraid of joining a club, don't start with the biggest club on your in your high school or on your campus, right? Don't start with the one that has the most people. Start out smaller or start out with something that feels more familiar and work up to it. So again, active coping though is really, really important to being able to build resilience. And it goes right along with that idea of emotional tolerance. The idea that, okay, this is making me a little worried, but I'm I'm gonna be okay. I can, I can, I can take that. I can build it up slowly. It's funny because in every conversation we've had, avoidance comes up through the topics of mental health. Everyone talks about avoidance in every area. Um, so I think it's just unavoidable, <laughs> um, yes. for sure. Um, and I wanted to talk about, so we've gone through a lot of the process of building resilience, um, like we said, internally, externally. And I wondered, what can we do when our motivation you know, waxes and wanes? Like, How can we keep on uh, with our routines and building the resilience so that we don't give up? Because I'm sure at times it gets really hard. 
Yeah, you know, I think one thing that helps is if we can remind ourselves that trauma or stress, um, it's not something that's all internal. Um, you know, it's really easy for people to blame themselves and say, well, I'm just not doing this right. I haven't taken the the right number of bubble baths or lit, lit the right number of scented candles, right? Um and our culture and our society also needs to change. Um, so we also need to focus on prevention. And that kind of gives, you know, that's why that, that last cornerstone of resilience is also about meaning and purpose. Um, we need to find ways to sort of change our culture around these things, um, you know, around trauma and make and, and have less people experience these kinds of traumas. Um, and I always tell folks that you don't have to focus necessarily, like your life's purpose doesn't have to be focused directly on a trauma that you've gone through, right? I mean, you can find ways to have meaning and purpose in your own life. And it, it does not have to be directly related to your stressors. It can be, you know, I'm a survivor of community violence, but I really like working with seniors. And that's how I find connection and meaning and purpose in my life. Those things can be small. Um, you know, I, you see the, you see examples of, of these types of things every day. I think um, also getting inspiration from people around us when our motivation is waning. Um, I often like to look at for example, I'll just give you an example. Um, you know, where I work, we um, have public transportation not too far away, and it's a really busy train station. And there's a there's a coffee, the small coffee place right there, and it's often students that work in those jobs. And you know, you'll get somebody who might be putting themselves through college, and they'll you know, there was a guy that worked there for I think a year and a half, two years. It doesn't matter what time of day I went in there, he'd always know what kind of coffee I wanted because he just found a way to remember people. And I mean, there's hundreds of people that go through there every day. Um, and it made my day so much more pleasant. And I know that sounds awfully silly, but at the same time, when I was, you know, thinking about this book and writing it, like those are days where you feel like, oh, what's the purpose? And I'm so overwhelmed. And you say, wow, like there can be small little ways to connect with people. Um, and just finding those, those stories of inspiration in other people. Um, sometimes the incident I've been sharing with other folks is that who, um, is a senior. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I went over there and I thought I was helping her out. I said, you know, we can buy groceries for you, whatever you need. And she looked at me and she said, she's in her eighties. And she said, Oh, sweetheart, you know, we, my husband and I lived through World War II. We'll, we're going to be okay. And she said, you know, I had to be relocated when I was in World War II and we weren't allowed out of our houses for two years. And she said, look at us. We're in our garden, aren't we? The two of us are outside breathing the air. We're going to be okay. And I just looked at her and I'm like, I thought I was doing something for you. And here you gave me this incredible story. Thank you for that. Um, I'm getting all emotional just thinking of it. But those are days when we feel low. It's unbelievable the amount of uh, inspiration that's out there. We just have to keep searching for it. Yeah, you, that story gave me chills on my arms. Um, I love that. And I think uh, that is so important is finding that perspective um, and sort of that also requires you to step outside yourself and, and shift your perspective. We've talked a lot about resilience through this conversation, but I just wondered if you could kind of summarize why resilience is so important to strengthen and why, like, to hone in on that. Because, you know, we basically, we can't get away from stress. I, I wish we could, <laughs> you know, I wish we, there was a utopian place that we could move to and that we <laughs> wouldn't have any stressors and we wouldn't have any setbacks, but that is the human condition of being alive, right? And I think that part of resilience is just teaching ourselves. There are days where it's okay to not be okay. And that it's, it's resilience isn't a destination. It's a set of skills that we try to commit to. 
and one size doesn't fit all. And guess what? Even our own size keeps growing and changing. And I think that's what's sort of interesting. I mean, I've found it interesting for me and my clients and folks that I talk to is that we have to keep changing our strategies. Like there's not one, maybe there's a certain recipe that works for us for a little bit, and then we have to change it up. And so we have to be kind to ourselves, but we also have to hold ourselves accountable. And then we also have to hold society accountable. We need policies that keep us safe and healthy too. So, you know, it's all in the mix. It's like, it's such a balance and it's, we're never, we're going to keep working and we'll, and we're never going to get there. And that's okay too. (laughs) <laughs> if only life was measured in bubble baths and candles. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, Sheila, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners before we wrap up? Again, just, you know, um, keep keep working on it every day. Be kind to yourself. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that keeps on changing every day. Nobody, no, if, if someone tells you that they, that they have the exact recipe to resilience, um, that's not true. It just keeps on changing. So be kind to yourself. That was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, I think I think saying that there's no perfect recipe is the best answer for that because I think people are always looking for a an exact solution to the Quick problem. Fix. And yeah, sometimes that just doesn't exist. So well, thank you so much, Sheila. This was a great conversation. Cassie and I are always really happy to talk about things that we're interested in in our personal lives that we talk about through work. So um, resilience is definitely one that we've talked about a lot for the last two years. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sheila. Being a teen today is stressful. That's why you need real tools to help you cope with all of life's challenges, from small stressors like homework, social media, and dating, to serious trauma resulting from bullying, school shootings, violence, and now pandemics. The key to dealing with all these difficult events is resilience, the ability to recover from setbacks or trauma and forge ahead with emotional strength. The best thing about resilience is that it can be learned. In the Resilient Teen, psychologist, teen expert, and trauma specialist Sheila Raja offers 10 skills grounded in key principles from psychology and neuroscience to help you manage difficult emotions, recover from difficult situations, and cultivate a sense of joy, even in the face of setbacks and modern-day stressors. You'll learn essential strategies for self-care, how to establish a healthy lifestyle, and how to set limits on technology. You'll also discover how mindfulness can help you deal with stress and challenging emotions in the moment tips for building better relationships with family and friends, and tools for dealing with disappointment. Visit our website at www.newharpenter.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For nearly 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. Founded by psychologists Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Help your clients achieve lasting emotional balance with the DBT Skills Mega Bundle from New Harbinger Publications. This essential collection offers everything you need to effectively deliver dialectical behavior therapy in your practice, including a set of eight exclusive micro skills videos to help improve client motivation in treatment. Visit newharbinger.com for more information. If you enjoyed today's episode, We'd love if you rated, reviewed, and subscribed to the show, and we hope you might share it with anyone who might benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider.